I'd like to call this meeting to order on May 11, 2021 at 7.01. And tonight we have a presentation from CPAC. And I think Holly is here. And I just is here also. I think I saw her there. Yes. Hello. Who's going to speak? Both of you? I'm going to speak tonight. Okay. Um, so I'm Holly Johnson. I'm co-chair of the district CPAC Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And we are here tonight submitting this report as part of a CPAC's duties required by law in Massachusetts. This is our very first year doing this because the CPAC officially passed bylaws and elected board members just this patch March 2020, right before all the closures. Um, so this is our first year. And it has been a difficult year for everybody. And so I just want to start out by thanking all the teachers, the IAs, the support staff, just everybody for going above and beyond for their students this year. The flexibility and dedication they have shown this year has been amazing. And we are so appreciative. We worked with administration this year around COVID planning to get IEP students as much in-person learning as possible. And while there were some delays um, for some families overall, we feel the district did a really great job providing in-person learning opportunities really for all students, um, particularly students um, with IEPs. Of course, uh, students on IEPs are still gonna take longer to catch up and adjust to changes and um, would like these long-term needs to be kept in mind um, in future years during programming and budgeting plans. Um, we also recommend that the district provide professional development and training on managing behavioral issues um, to all teachers, gen ed, special ed, service providers, IAs, um, and develop individual action plans to support students, especially in light of these additional issues COVID restrictions um, may have caused. It's um, so important for this, the people working with these kids to really be trained in, in de-escalation and, and um, behavior issues to really you know, help these students learn. Um, with the support from the special ed department, we were able to hold our monthly meetings and workshops remotely via Zoom. The first portion of all our meetings are open to everyone and usually include a presentation and updates. And this is followed by our private support group for caregivers. Um, we've also recently added what we're calling coffee and conversation, which is a more informal chat for caregivers that's happening once a month on Tuesday mornings. Um, we really appreciate the support the CPAC has been getting this year from district administrators and all of you on the school committee, we've built really strong relationships over the years with um, the early childhood and elementary administrators. And we are working on um, strengthening our relationships with administrators at Frontier and really learning more about the special ed program at Frontier. Um, I think we tend to get younger families. So we are just, we have really good relationships with the elementary school. We're working to um, learn more about what happens at Frontier and, and be more involved. Um, we've also, board members have regularly attended the Special Ed Strategic Planning Committee meetings throughout the year, and we've met with various administrators to discuss COVID planning, elementary technology, elementary professional development, Frontier IEPs, and 504s and disability inclusion. Um, we've also had admins, um, principals, staff, and school committee members attend some of our um, monthly meetings and some have given presentations. Of course, all these wonderful things happening in this district, we are tasked with the responsibility to evaluate the SPED program. And we do have some concerns uh, district-wide regarding special ed compliance, documentation, communication, and training to varying degrees throughout the district. So, if a family or staff or community member feels that a school is not meeting legal requirements, they can file a complaint with DESE using DESE's problem resolution system or PRS. PRS then investigates that complaint and decides whether or not the school is in compliance of the law. Um, unfortunately, due to delay with PRS, we do not have official numbers um, and data from them. 
Um, we've only have what we heard from families and we have not heard from any frontier families saying that they have filed a complaint this year. In addition to PRS, families can also contact the Bureau of Special Education Appeals or BSEA about special education concerns. The BSEA conducts due process hearings and renders rulings and decisions. The BSA does not keep data for individual schools. It just has kind of district-wide data and they have received 11 notifications of rejected IEPs and provided one informational training for our district in the past year. However, I'm not sure how, how accurate that 11 rejected IEP number may be because it has been come clear that these rejected, partially rejected and unsigned IEPs were not reported to the state until recently. So a family receives their IEP and they sign it to accept it, reject, partially reject. If the IEP is, is partially rejected, fully rejected, or hasn't been signed within 30 days, the district needs to report that to the state. And then the state sends an informational packet home to families to explain their rights and, and next steps and um, give them a lot of helpful information. So if the district doesn't report the unsigned IEPs, then those families don't get that much needed information. Um, We've also compiled concerns from families through meetings and, and uh, emails and surveys. And when we see the same concern multiple times from different families, we included it in our report. So overall, again, the SPED teachers and the IAs and the service providers are just amazing. They foster these really personal relationships with their students and create a wonderful sense of community, a community that is just a huge, strength and plus for our district. Um, on an administrative level, there are concerns again with documentation, adherence to legal timelines. Um, state and federal laws make it very clear what documentation is required and when it needs to be provided to caregivers. And we've heard numerous violations of these laws. And the frequency of these complaints varies by school. That probably sounds like a paperwork issue and doesn't sound super important. However, when these things are delayed, services are delayed and evaluations are delayed. And it's the state has these timelines in place so that students get what they need as soon as possible. And the process from evaluation to IEP should take about should take 45 days. And it definitely takes longer than that, sometimes twice as long. And then from the time you have your IEP meeting, to the time you're supposed to have that document in your hand is two weeks. And we hear reports that it's weeks or months longer than that. And that leads to delays in services and that kind of builds up over the years. Um, we have also reviewed the district's policies and procedures. There's actually um, a procedures manual that is well written. However, it is difficult to find on the district website and most families aren't aware that this manual exists. Um, so we would recommend that professional development on this uh, special education procedures manual is given to all SPED, SPED teachers and service providers and that the document is distributed to parents and teachers um, on a yearly basis along with what we call an IEP timeline cheat sheet, which is basically a one page that very clearly shows you the IEP timeline and, and when things need to happen. Um, we are also recommending that um, IEP meetings can be streamlined by using a meeting summary template, which is found in the district's bed procedures manual, but we don't often see used at meetings. And we'd like the district wide anti racism initiative, which is great to continue to include um, students with disabilities as well. So that that was basically a, an overview of the district. I'm just going to speak briefly um, on Frontier in particular. So in the district, there's a total of 326 students on IEPs. 125 of those students are at Frontier, making up 19% of the total student population at Frontier. There are 10 special education teachers. So that means that the ratio between students and IEPs to SPED teacher is 13 to one. The main concern we hear from families um, at Frontier is around transitions. 
Families have said that they weren't able to observe potential placement options for their children, which makes it harder for them to decide, you know, where they want to put their children and what's best for them. And they stated that they did not know who their IEP liaison was year to year, so who they would go to with questions and concerns, and that there wasn't an adequate transition plan in place, which is, it's important to have that transition plan. So our recommendation would be that a phone call, an email, or um, a full transition meeting is offered to all IEP students every school year. Finally, there's been concerns around school culture at Frontier, which you are all aware of and working very hard to, to um, improve with the anti-racism committee, but we, we do want you to be aware that there have been complaints of derogatory name calling towards students with disabilities by their peers at Frontier. And we, we recommend that policies, procedures, and school culture be updated to include equity for disabled students and that the, um, there's professional development on providing cultural responsible, responsive classrooms in regards to physical, sensory, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral disabilities. Um, and that, that's pretty much all I have. I know it was a lot. If you, I really appreciate everyone giving us the time, putting us on the agenda, and listening to our report. If you have any questions, I can try and answer them. I got a, a Damien Fosno. I just got a real quick question. Um, I really appreciate your report and all the information you gave. Um, and just to kind of clarify um, some of the um, material that you talked about, were those surveys that you put out? Was it a, a, a data kind of driven um, where you got some of that information? Or is, I guess I'm just curious how you came up with some of the um, uh, concerns that you have, where, where that came from? The concerns were brought to us by families. We have um, distributed surveys over the course of the year. Um, we have an email list of families that we communicate with on a regular basis. Families reach out to us with their concerns via email or they come to meetings or support groups and we compiled it that way. Um, like, I, like I said, if, it's, if we hear the same complaint multiple times, then it made the report. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Does anybody else have a question for Holly? Holly, think. Oh, Keith. No, I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering. Uh, um, uh, special education students are really. Um, there's a I, I, Holly you mentioned paperwork is like the big issue. That's what I you know. There's a lot of of time that goes into that. So like the two things that stuck out to me for one was is there a mechanism before you have to go to a PRS complaint or BSA complaint? Is there a mechanism that you can address right to the school right away that could limit the amount of time it has to go to the state? And then the second one, and I know maybe this is a Darius. So for me as a classroom teacher, I'll get upwards of twelve to twenty. IEPs and they're 25 to 30 pages each. So right at the beginning, I got like three to 500 pages of reading. And I honestly can't really absorb that with any real. So I try to like narrow it down. And you mentioned a cheat sheet. Is there any way that the, 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 the massive amount of data can be streamlined so the classroom teachers, and this is different from a substantially separate student versus a student who streamlined, that, the, the, that it can be streamlined so that the, the classroom teacher can take that data in, in a couple of pages rather than like hundreds and hundreds of pages. So I guess those are my two questions. Yes. Well, first, um, before you file a PRS, we would recommend go to first your, your SPED liaison, your principals, your directors, all the, you know, you, you send emails and, and, um, but you you work it. We obviously recommend you try to work with the teachers in the school before it gets to you sending a peer, you know, a complaint or, or going to BSEA. But there are instances where you know you're at an impasse or things aren't working out, and you kind of have to take the next step. But it's not it's not the first step. We would not recommend that to be the first step. As far as um, the 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 dense. IEP. It's huge. As a parent, I've read so many and they're hard to get through for my one kid. I can't imagine a teacher trying to take that all in, um, especially as a, a gen ed teacher or something. I have seen um, in my research, it's it's called like a one sheet. 
And it's a very brief summary of the child's disabilities, needs, accommodations, and it's it's a one sheet. I don't I haven't seen it in in this district, but it's definitely something that um, I think we could have, especially I think at Frontier or at the you know when you have that many students, and it is it just kind of boils down your IEP to highlights or a 504, just a one sheet. So I think that's something that you guys could look into. There's examples just if you Google it. But yeah, I've, I've kind of learned to try to negotiate them, but it, it can still be a little bit overwhelming. And and, uh, and and what it came when I've questioned it, it comes back to well, legally we have to provide you with the entire document, and then that's what makes it difficult. And I'm sorry, can I chime in real quick? And I, I and I know for a fact a number of our special education teachers do that for the the they'll do it for their teachers. They'll do the one sheet so that that, that they will have access to that as well. So that, so that we that we do do that at Frontier. And we also have team meetings for transition between grade levels. So the seventh grade SPED liaison meets with the eighth grade SPED line, goes through the case listings, what they've been working on, and, and they do that each step of the way. And so and then in high school, the SPED liaisons will go around and, and talk with each of the teachers on their caseload. Uh, the students are on the, the students' teacher of, of each of their caseload and go through that. Um, again, it's a lot of time. And so do they know everybody's SPED plan inside and out on the first day of school? It may take several days as they, as they go back. They, they start that process now. And each student coming into Frontier has a has a transition meeting, um, in which we send um, we have our team leader here at the, uh, the middle school um, goes down and meets with the family and talks about the transition and and modifies um, if needed the plan to into Frontier. So that's happening as well. So there is there is uh, some of those things are happening. Um, I mean, we need to spell that out better, um, but you know, looking at that report. There's a lot of good things in the report of things that we we do need to work on, um, and uh, so you know, we're going to add that to a part of our, our strategic plan and how we're going to unroll that out and, and take the data from that report as well. I will say that I did meet my personally with Carolyn Eddy, the team leader um, at Frontier, and she's she's great, and she that's her job with the transitions and working with everybody. Um, my speaking with her. I would think that sometimes um, parents may not be as aware that they can reach out. They don't have to wait to be reached out to. They can reach out at any time. Carolyn Eddy is available to to answer questions. Um, so uh, just a matter of, of getting that sort of information out there a little bit more for families that are struggling with transitions. But um I, she she was great. I learned a lot from her. I think I took five pages of notes when I met with her. Um, and she she does a lot of work there at Frontier. Um, hi, Karen Ferrandino. For those of you who don't know me, Director of Student Services Special Education. Um, I just was in an earlier meeting uh, where Asia went over the report uh, specific to the earlier uh, elementary school that had their school committee meeting. And I just uh, want to say, if it, it's a it's a thorough report uh, that uh, was submitted yesterday, and I really want to take the time to kind of go over it, uh, to you know really look at priorities and continue communication with the CPAC. Uh, but as far as school committee, if you have time to, there's a written report to kind of look at it and digest it. If you have any questions for me, um, as we continue in the process working to improve and and strengthen the foundation of our special education programs, I'd be happy to come back and answer any questions that you might have specific to the report, questions, concerns, ideas. Uh, but I also want to thank Asia and Holly um, and the commitment uh, talking about the organization of the CPAC and, and building it into elected uh, officials uh, of the CPAC and really kind of organizing that and the ongoing communication. And I know uh, there's a lot of effort and time and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, co commitment, uh, care, care, absolute care in what they're doing and building the community. And I just want to thank you for your time and your communication. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Okay, how about uh, we review the minutes from April 6, please? Motion, second. Motion from Judy. Second. second. Thank you, Bill. Roll call. 
Bob? Yes. Lynn? Yeah. Bill? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry, it was delayed. <laughs> okay. Keith? Yes. Uh, Missy? Yes. And Bill? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, you there? I am. I'm here. With big smiles tonight. You want to give us a financial <laughs> report, please? Sure. Uh, so 20 warrants were signed since the last meeting. Um, I think Mr. Holla came in today, actually reviewed and signed them. Thank you for that. Uh, the total, Judy, is in the report that I shared, but yep. for the record, yep. you got it? Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll rattle it off just, just so we have it recorded. Um, $2,440,411.79. Um, I sent the expense reports. That's through April 30th. Uh, for school choice and the general fund. Um, things are on track, you know, as we anticipated they would be with overages or expenditures in specific accounts, but I'm happy to take questions. You know, we're really starting to look closely at each budget line, um, paying a little bit more attention to what's left in certain lines now that we're nearing the end of the year. George and I have had a conversation about um, supplies and materials and making sure that POs are in the system and everything is encumbered uh, so that we can start to get a more realistic number at where we are at for the end of the year because we do have some savings in certain lines. Transportation is just one example of where we have some savings because of contract negotiations this year with the educational model. So, you know, we may be making some adjustments to accounts, um, reallocating things from or to school choice typical process for this time of year. And I am in conversation with the auditor about doing some pre-planning for E&D just to make sure that we are on top of all of that. Um, I do know that we are going to have to <clears throat> compensate for the school lunch deficit. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about since last May, probably. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to be close to uh, a zero balance, um, but you know, I'm still sort of estimating what those amounts are and we really should go into next year with some type of cushion. We have savings um, from general fund budget, like I just talked about, that we can move those wages onto the general fund and not have to hit any other funding sources such as school choice. Um, but we're, you know, we're close to surpassing um, revenue with our expenses. So Jeff and I are in conversation about that and projecting out what the rest of the year looks like. Uh, and then I also just wanted to give you an update on COVID expenses. So we do have some funds remaining in um, federal and state grants. Again, in conversation with George and other administrators about how to spend that money down, whether it's tent rentals, buying more chairs or tables. Uh, to date, I believe we've spent about $350,000 on COVID-related needs, primarily funded either from our four-town Municipal Cares Act or grant funding. Um, some things have hit the local budget. Uh, if you look at buildings and supplies, for example, in the general fund report, you will see that's over. That's in part because of HVAC expenses that were higher than we anticipated. Um, but for the most part, we've been really fortunate and been able to cover all of these unknown needs this year with um, funds outside of our school choice or outside of our budget. So we're grateful for that. Um, that's all I have right now. Um, more to be discussed, I think, later on finances. But yeah, Damien, you have a question? Uh, yeah, the, um, one could make an argument that the lunch budget has been tight because of COVID. Um, I know just speaking from personal experience, my kids have not gotten school lunch just because of the way the school day has progressed and the way they have to eat it and so forth. It's just easier for them to bring in their own lunch. So if we are short with that lunch budget, could we use the extra remaining COVID funds to supplement that? So Darius, please correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm understanding and reading so far, the funds that have been available to date, you cannot offset revenue loss. You can use those funds to pay for expenditures, but they have to be 
unbudgeted expenses. So we haven't had that instance in school lunch. Um, our real problem is that we do not have a la carte available in the way that we have in the past. And while numbers are down for one, a lot of kids are not eating, but when they are eating, they're getting free and it's basically just the lunch that's available. We're selling some chips and some drinks, but in prior years, we've done between 50 and $75,000 in um, a la carte items like, you know, Kids go and get an ice cream after they eat their two slices of pizza. We're not doing that this year. And that is COVID related, but you can't, as far as I understand it, offset revenue. Um, it is unfortunate. I, I heard that with ESSER 3 funding that could be funding you coming, you could do that. Um, but I don't have enough guidelines on it yet, unless Darius has other information that I'm not seeing. Um, but even if we can get back to a spot where we can open up those a la carte things again, we'll be in a much better position than we are this year. Okay, thanks. Does anybody else have any questions for Shelly? Yeah, okay. Shelly. If there's no other questions for Shelly, thank you, Shelly. And we'll go on to, believe it or not, there's no public comment tonight. Uh, next one would be student council report. And where's Miss Leon? I'm right here. Where? I don't see her yet. Oh, there you are. Hi. So I'm Maddie, as you guys probably know. And for the last time, um, I'm here with the student council report. Um, today, I'm also joined by Harrison Wright. He is one of our new co-presidents for the student council. Um. So, so far, Student Council has talked about trying to get that club fair into action that we've talked about for months now, um, trying to confirm the step update um, with administration and see, seeing if we can get just a few clubs to be there for the um, incoming middle schoolers. Um, and besides that, Isabel and I, the president and vice president, would like to thank you guys for um listening to us for this past year and i'd all i would also like to thank you for um listening to me talk about student council for two and a half years um i'm really thankful for this opportunity and you guys have been i'm tearing up oh my god and you guys have been um just so supportive of all of our endeavors so i just want to thank you cool can you hey harrison can you come on so we can see what you look like Something is wrong with my camera. I'm not sure. I look like I'm in the uh, dark, but I'm not at all. I don't know what's happening. No, well, we can see you. Everybody can see him, right? We just want to see who the person is going to take this wonderful lady's place. So, Okay, next thing is uh, unfinished business uh, COVID update. Keith was waving something. Yeah, I got a quick question. Could I ask uh, Madeline or Harrison the student perspective on how like the prom and those end of years like that stuff went? I read it in George's report, but I'd like to yeah. I was wondering how students think. Yes. Can you still hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So prom was great. I had a great time. I loved it. Everybody looked great. I know I keep saying that. I think the parents. Parents who pitched in did a wonderful job. Administration did a great job. I had so much fun um, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Everybody looks so pretty. <laughs> and as of end of the year things, you know, seniors, we've got like two and a half weeks left. That's been a bit stressful for everybody with AP exams, um, you know, finishing sports seasons and just trying to regulate our lives. Um, the graduation schedule has been put out, so everybody's planning on what they're gonna do for that, along with um, sort of finals and um, our last day of classes. It's just been bittersweet for everyone and everybody 
is sort of getting um, <coughs> emotional as we enter these last few weeks. Um, not just me, um, but a lot of my friends, a lot of our parents. Um, it's just an interesting time and I don't think we're ready. Well, you've been only been going to school for over 12 years, so. So I would I would just like to say the uh, last year's seniors it was it was a rush for them it happened fast but this year's seniors have gone through this a long time and so I'm I'm just really happy that the, the prom worked out and the end of year's festivities are really working out for you guys and that you're really appreciating it and I and I hope it it's a great ending for you because it's been a been the hardest year of probably any seniors that have ever gone through high school so I'm just really happy that the the end is at least uh, positive for you. Okay. Yeah. I'll just chip, I'll just chip in and say that was as as usual just a wonderful report and thank you so much. Anybody else want to share anything else? I'll make sure to send her the, you know all of our meetings so she doesn't feel lonely at school. <laughs> <laughs> From a proud mama. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go on to uh, COVID update. Mr. Uh, Medeso, please. Hey, Bob, do you want to just do our guests right off that we've kind of talked about? So okay. just have a, let's have the anti-racism and then our, our Washington, D.C. trip. Okay. I see. I saw somebody on. Uh, Kelsey, I think, is here. Kelsey is on, yep. Yes, I am. Um, and I apologize. My camera is not working, and I failed to grab a Chromebook on my way out of work today. So I apologize for not having video. Um, so we're kind of winding down here at the end of the year. Um, we Tomorrow is our first in-person discussion group. So we've been doing these virtual Wednesday discussions um, since January, February. So for these last couple of Wednesdays in May, we're inviting students to get together in person, which is a little bit of a different um, different vibe than being virtual. So it'll be interesting to see how that impacts the discussion. Um, just giving them a chance to reflect on all the different dis the different discussion topics we've had, um, and also hearing from them what their visions are for Frontier moving forward um, and what they would like to see happen at the school. Um, so we're excited for those conversations to happen. Um, and like I said, the first one's tomorrow. Um, there will be a full committee meeting before the end of the school year um, so that we can clarify priorities for next year um, so that when we come back in the fall, we're clear on what we want to accomplish and what direction we're headed in. Um, so I did want to give you all an opportunity to ask any questions about the work that we've done this year. Um, and also let me know if there are any any topics or concerns that you want to make sure um, we, we the whole committee is thinking about as we're moving um, as we're planning for next year and moving forward. Anybody could chime in if they like. So uh, I will, Kelsey. So after 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 this first year has. Has there been a uh, noticeable uh, uh, impact? Um, it just uh, you know, is I, it, I'm not not saying as if I expect there to be, but has there been? Uh, is it a kinder, gentler little world there? Um, that it's a it's that's a tough thing to measure, um, especially with this year being hybrid. But I will say I think there's definitely a notable um heightened level of awareness um i think if you stop most students in the hall and ask them if they've heard of anti-racism they will probably be able to say yes and might even be able to tell you what it is um so the eighth grade right now is working on their their civics project that's required by the state and i've had and part of that is there they have to reach out to to resources so i've had one group that reached out to me um because they wanted to put together a group for education about racism against um, Asian Americans. And then I had another group that reached out to me um, wanting to put together resources for teaching students about implicit bias. 
And that's that's ideas that these eighth graders came up with on their own for their group project. Um, so I do think that I do think seeds have been planted. Um, and I think especially in the high school, we are seeing that there are students who are really passionate about this and excited about these topics and really want to engage um, with this kind of material. I see, um, I see Missy had her hand up. Yeah, I'm not sure that this will, uh, it's still kind of formulating in my head, so I hope it comes across okay. Um, I'm, I've seen this kind of come up both in public comments uh, with community members, and it sounds like this has come up um, with students as well. And I wonder whether or not there's some some work that can be done on kind of how to engage in conversations with each other and keep this in a respectable, respectable, productive uh, way to, to engage in conversations with people who may have different opinions about some of these topics that oftentimes kind of bring on some passionate sides for, for people on, on different spectrums uh, in regards to diversity. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that is part of what we've been doing with kind of this pilot program this year with the discussion groups um, of giving students the opportunity to, to talk about some uncomfortable topics and um, have some differing opinions, um, to sort of give them practice doing that. And then next year, we actually have a class um, that will run every other day all year um, where we'll be training students more or less to facilitate these kinds of conversations and giving them those um, active listening skills, conflict, conflict resolution, um, so that they are comfortable leading these discussions with their classmates. Um, and we can really have that be a wider practice throughout the whole school. Um, and we really s establish those norms of, okay, this is how we disagree in a respectful way. And is that both in person and through uh, other media platforms? Ah, you mean social media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I believe the class is called Media Activism and, and Social Change. Uh, so yes, that can absolutely be a topic um, because I'm aware that um, students, what students are willing to say in class and in front of adults can often be very different from what they post on their personal accounts. And, and how they interact with those is, is different too, right? Right, right. And it's, you know, it's tricky because we as a school, you know, we're limited in, in how much control we have over what students are posting on their personal accounts. But um, I do think that over time, we can set a precedent and we can kind of shift the culture of, um, of how students interact with their, with their media accounts um, and just the level, of, the level of respect and kindness that we all have for each other. Thanks. Anybody else have a question for Kelsey? Yeah, I have a question, um, Kelsey. So thinking back on, I think it was our last meeting and we had during public comment, people who had some other perspectives, um, maybe not in what you were doing, but some of the hows, and your group, you know, encouraged people to open those dialogues and contact, um, contact you and have those discussions. And I was just wondering if that has moved forward at all, if you've heard from anybody or have a plan to open those conversations with families. I have not been contacted by anyone. Um, I don't believe Amanda has, um, and I know that I know that folks reach out to admin on a fairly regular basis. So I don't know if they've they've had any specific updates since that meeting. Um, but in terms of having a community discussion, I think I think there is a lot of value in that, um, and I think it's also something that we would probably want to wait until we can do it in person. Um, I think that, that that would be valuable to be able to sit down together um, as a community and actually like physically see each other's faces and be in, in space together um, to have these conversations. But I do think um, I do think a parent info night um, or some community discussions would really be beneficial um, so that parents and families and the community in general um, is a little bit more comfortable with what's being what's being taught in school, what's going on in school. 
Um, Cause I know that there is, sometimes there is that fear that it's, it's getting very political and we're trying to, you know, influence students a certain way. And it's really, that's really not what it's about. It's about, um, it's about learning about the society that we live in. It's about learning to recognize our own bias and the way that we can support things that are problematic without even knowing we're supporting things that are problematic and how we can change that as we move forward um, to really make everything better for everybody. Right, thank you. I was hoping that, you know, before we get to the point where you're ready for a bigger community discussion, that maybe some of the smaller conversations and um, people would feel comfortable reaching out. So I'm still hopeful that that will happen. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else have anything for Kelsey? Kelsey, thanks for coming and giving us an update. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Take care now. You too. We're going to jump up. We have uh, Melissa and Jason here on the Washington trip. So since they're waiting for us, we'll have them come on and and try to coax us on voting them to go to Washington, D.C. next year. So, Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Jason Smith. I teach eighth grade civics and history at Frontier. This is my 21st year. Uh, and uh, I'm also the eighth grade team leader. Um, it's hard to believe that last year, February 2020, we late February into early March 2020, we made it to Washington, D.C. successfully and had a absolutely wonderful trip. And all to find that the world was changing before our eyes. Uh, it's, it's pretty surreal to think back at, at that, as I, I'm sure you all can imagine. Um, I'm proud to just talk about this trip with you briefly, and then I'll pass it over to Melissa. It turns out, I, I had, last time I presented, I said it was the 30th year. Well, I stand corrected. This coming year, if this all can go forward, would be the 30th year. So my mistake there. Uh, Bob Smith and Walt Flynn, some of the originators and the creators of the trip were Reminded me that, and um, I'm thankful for all the work that they put into to laying this foundation for us. Um, needless to say, I think most of you probably know this has turned it evolved into a really a signature experience for Frontier kids and families. Um, kids talk about this trip for years and years after, um, in, through high school and and, and beyond. Um, it's for, for some of these kids, it is truly a life changing experience. I think it hits developmentally and curricular wise perfectly in the eighth grade, um, especially now that the eighth grade curriculum for civics and history is U.S. civics. That's really the thrust of the, the curriculum now. Um, so we we love doing it. We certainly missed it this year. Uh, we have heard from some students, some parents, and and our my colleagues about the the hope and the desire to continue this tradition to to make sure that we are able to hold on to this trip as the years go by, you know, despite the the uh, potential challenges and hurdles that we you know may see moving forward, and given these unique circumstances. Um, so that being said, we, we know there, there are some uh, unpredictable things possibly coming up, some, some circumstances that we may not be able to uh, fully understand quite yet. Uh, but uh, luckily, one, uh, one thing we feel real excited about is Melissa Strelke has taken over the coordination and the planning and the booking of the trips. We have in-house booking, thanks to Melissa for the past few years which has enabled the families to save significant amounts of money over the years. Um, I think um, I'd like to hand it off to her now so she can kind of give her her angle on, on how, how we're looking ahead to this the potential trip uh, for this coming year. So, uh, and we certainly ask, uh, answer questions afterwards. So Melissa, if you're ready, thank you. 
Thank you, Jason. Um, so yeah, um, I've had the pleasure of um, coordinating the trip with uh, Jason and the eighth grade team for the past few years. Um, and in thinking about next year, um, we have a lot of, as Jason said, um, hopes for bringing back the trip. And, and you know, we've had a lot of talks about this. Um, we obviously don't have any hard data of what we can expect next year to look like or what this might mean for the trip. Um, uh, but we we just kind of have, we kind of can't help ourselves in, in dreaming about the possibility. Um, and so what we're hoping uh, optimistically to bring forth for next year is um, something that hasn't happened since the first year uh, this trip actually ran. So um, we're hoping to uh, have an eighth and ninth grade parallel trip uh, for those eighth graders who weren't able to go this past year. Um, so they wouldn't all be going to all the places together because it's just, it might be too large of a group, but parallel trips going at the same time. Um, and the first time they tried to actually do this trip, they had to delay um, because of Operation Desert Storm. So they could not go that first year and they promised all the eighth graders that they'd bring them the next year. And so the first trip ended up being a combined eighth and ninth grade trip. Um, and so, so that's what we're kind of proposing, um, tonight when in high hopes and we recognize that, you know, due to the past year, um, there's been many hardships. Um, we definitely need, you know, a lot more support, you know, from the, uh, and looking at our whole school community and kind of pulling in support for financial aid, um, to ensure that all students would be able to go who'd want to. Um, and, you know, looking at this past year, right, we really have like a an amazingly supportive school community. So I have no doubt um, that is possible. Um, and so there's still many unknowns, but we're passing it off here, seeing what your thoughts are. If you want to give us permission to move forward in, in this endeavor um, and uh, we'd love to answer uh, questions to the best of our abilities. Thank you for concerning this. Melissa, how, my, the biggest question, I guess, oh, there's a lot of big questions, but how much is it this year or next year versus years ago? It, you know, our prices, I know you're doing everything, so thank you for doing that and saving us money, but, you know, I mean, how much do the kids have to come up with for each individual? Yeah, I think, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, um, was it under 700 last year or a couple of years ago? I believe it was just under, hovering right around, the, right around the 700 mark, but everything included, every single meal, whereas before the several meals you had to kind of add in on top and kids had to pack, pack you know, more more money in their wallet and so forth. So, so it's hovering right around 700, maybe off by $10 in either direction, something like that. But, but every, every, in theory, you wouldn't have to bring a nickel on the track. Right. Every single thing was paid for. Wow, that's yeah. Good. When we, when we switch, we're saving almost $200 a student. Wow. Perfect. We got some hands up. Uh, Olivia's first. Um, Sure. So in the past, my kids both went and they absolutely loved it. And I am, you know, hopeful um, that this can also happen. But in the past, um, there were overarching fundraisers that they would do as a big group. But then there are also ways that if you went, if you did a lot of fundraising, you could really, you know, get down your um, amount um, so that you weren't, you know, if the whole class put in 50% worth of effort, then that was great. And they raised some, but if you really knew like you needed to raise some money and you went to work and you raised a ton personally that you, a percent of that went to yours. So you could really bring down, and make it affordable. Is that still kind of your plan? Um, and, and Jason speak, you can speak more to this too. Um, I think like everything is on the floor. So we're not so we, when we were thinking about it, we were thinking not just like even past fundraisers, but we're like, we're going to have to come up with something even bigger to, to really kind of 
create a larger scholarship fund that we can draw from. And yeah, yeah, we're, you know, we were kind of brainstorming, like, if we, you know, hoping to maybe have like, um, a, a group of community members who would be on board for helping to coordinate fundraising in some ways, too. Like a spaghetti dinner or something? Yeah, this this uh, for quite a number of years there was the fish fry, and that that was <laughs> that was amazing. And um, uh, of course, Bob Smith and Don Gordon and others kind of helped put all that together. But uh, that would raise a huge fund. That was all scholarship. So that was, in other words, if if a kid sold ten tickets, it didn't necessarily um, lessen their price, their individual price. It was all, let's put it into the big pot for all the, you know, there's usually quite a few students who, have, who need significant help. Uh, those last two or three years, we tried something a little bit different. We tried a calendar raffle where it's, where it's kind of a, you get a little bit of both. You get, you'll get the general fund, but then the more tickets you sell, that also can trim down your cost. Um, and we've also done a couple of additional smaller supplemental. These used to be Hillside Pizza around the Super Bowl time. Mm. That that one I think was geared toward trimming down your own cost. Um, I think last year we threw in a you know Chipotle. You buy certain things you know at the Chipotle restaurant a certain night that gives the class a little more scholarship fund. Uh, we did Penny Wars where. Kids would put coins in different jars trying to compete, you know, different classes against each other. And again, that was more general fund. So, but as Melissa said, I think we really have to sit down and think about what's the most efficient, the most beneficial, um, you know, within reason. And that's why we're, I think that's why she mentioned, we may need a little, given the circumstances, given people's financial situations, possibly, we might just need to, be able to reach out a little bit more and get other ideas or other people who might be willing to organize or help organize something um, so that we can so that we can manage it. I usually write a bunch of letters to local organizations and and we've been really lucky. Some local organizations have uh, like the Polish American Citizens Club and uh, others that my brain isn't allowing me to think of at this moment have, have been really generous and 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 donating so there's that too but uh, again since it's we're just a little tentative on exactly what form that will take right this moment given do we just have to really sort through our landscape together got it missy you're next i have a couple of logistical questions um and i'm I, I, don't, I can't even imagine trying to plan for all the potential change in nine months after this past year we've had, but um, wondering what kind of busing capacity changes you guys might be thinking about. This is a lot of kids to be taking, and I don't know whether or not uh, how many, what the increase in buses might be looking out that far, or if you guys have looked at that. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, and like, like I said, there are so many unknowns. Um, and, and it's interesting because when we were first, you know, thinking about it back in February, we're like, oh, there's no way, there's no way it can happen. And like, it's such a different world now than it is in February. So it's, there's, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Like, it's gonna, I feel like it'll probably be more of like, having to figure out that that flexibility and you know that closer planning but this is this is where we definitely need need <laughs> support and and it's and it's hard to um you know know like you know today we might need you know six buses for um you know 75 students and then in three months will that change um yeah, and um, hopefully vaccination status, which has been expanded to include kids that are in this age group, you know, hopefully that helps to maybe 
send us in a path where you don't have to restrict those buses quite as much. But I guess that's kind of another component is whether or not there's some different criteria for kids that have been vaccinated versus not vaccinated because there's a different safety profile there. I just, I, I'm just thinking about these things from, <laughs> again, from a logistical standpoint, but um, that's a lot <laughs> so far ahead of time. It's hard to predict what things will look like. Thanks, Missy. Yeah. Uh, Keith, you're next. So as a father of a, of a daughter who went a couple of years ago and a daughter who was not able to go last year, you came on and said, I'm Jason Smith and I want to talk about Washington, D.C. and you had my vote right away. So like this, <laughs> you're right. it, it has become a rite of passage. She's really excited about going. Um, I thank you for even thinking about this right now and looking forward. It's really important for them. And I think, um, you know, we'll do every family do what they can. But like a summer job is going to be a great impetus for my daughter this year for like to raise money, like get to work. Cool. Anybody else have a, a question for Jason or Melissa? It if you don't mind me chiming in briefly, and, and of, of course, there are forces beyond what it, things I can understand as far as whether the state will, you know, issue this, you know, guideline or when that might happen. Uh, obviously, some of you and Darius, of course, are tapped into kind of how that information comes along. But I believe, Melissa, we could lay some groundwork if 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 you if we get the approval to at least put some pieces in place and then maybe be prepared to deal with whatever information is coming down the pipeline that will affect all the schools all the districts i would guess about regarding field trips and such so jason i think you kind of nailed it i think you probably would want to just map out a calendar of when just like you used to do in the past about when the deadlines of certain things were going to be made as well as the deadlines for decisions to make and you're absolutely right the 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 environment's going to change every month. Three months ago is very different than that today, and two months from now is going to be very different as well. So, um, and also on the fundraising thing, you're talking about, I think we really are going to have to look at private donations as well. I think fundraising spaghetti dinners are wonderful. When you walk away with two grand and you're going to try to send 200 kids, you're sending two classes worth, you know, that, that doesn't do enough. Um, and so while those things build community and makes ownership, I think we're also going to try to have to do a stronger push to say, listen, folks, this is an important rite of passage and really go after that as well. Um, you know, get some bigger donations. Um, so anyway, and I say that out loud to people in the audience because people know people who are in the private sector who, you know, they look for ways to give to the community and um, civic groups that, you know, sending a class to Washington, D.C. to talk about um, how this country works and that kind of stuff is, is more than just a rite of passage. Sometimes it's the only time they've ever been out of New England. You know, the only time they've been away from home multiple nights, you know, um, outside of family. So it's a big, it's a big deal. Thank you. Thank you. Missy, do you have another one? Another question? I do. Uh, I am wondering whether or not, uh, whether or not there's any potential to look at different timing. Uh, and I, I'm, again, just throwing this out there, having looked at this past year and what was happening shortly after the holidays that I'd hate to have you guys put all this planning in and everybody get all their hopes up. I mean, I think it's a great trip and go for it, but I, I'm wondering if there might be some ability to try to plan for a less likely time for there to be a spike in cases. Uh, it, just something to for you guys to think about as you're trying to negotiate all the other unknowns with this. <laughs> like the April vacation, maybe. Something that's further away from right after people have gotten together, and and again, also that's something to think about with fundraising things. That maybe having hundreds of people together with food is not really the. <laughs> we don't want to doom the own, our own <laughs> trip, right? <laughs> right. I think that's a great point, and traditionally, the reason the trip is in late February into March is because the crowds are so much less. It's easier to book and book things. Uh, you're not waiting in line for an hour trying to get into a museum and so forth. But I, I think that's duly noted and we should, you know, we'll certainly, the, the crew that comes together will, I'm sure we'll talk about that. 
if you go on Christmas, then you will avoid families getting together with their relatives and the crowds. So we could try that. Anybody else have anything? If not, how about a motion and a second to approve this trip? Hold on. That's what we're doing. We're planning the approval of the trip or the approval to plan. What are we doing? Approve the trip. Okay. For February 2022? Yes. Okay. Do we have a second? Oh, Livia made the motion. First? Yeah, Livia made the motion. Second. Thank you, Bill. Do a roll call, Judy, please. Bob? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bill? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Uh, Damien? Yes. Heath? Yes. Melissa? Oh, sorry, yeah. Missy? That's all right. And Bill, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Jason, Melissa, Melissa, thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Take Thanks care. so much, everybody. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to uh, some type of order. I know it screwed up Judy a little bit, but okay. she can handle it. Uh, Darius, COVID update? Um, nothing huge other than the sense of, um, you know, we kind of, high school's back. Um, middle and high school are back. And if you could just, I think Maddie kind of talked about that in her report that the energy in the building is just unbelievable. And if you want a piece of that energy, stop by after school and just see the kids. They kind of just, they've washed off the, the, the ick of all the stuff that COVID has brought. And they just, they kind of, I don't know, you, I don't, you go out to watch a track practice or walk by a softball or baseball. I mean, it's the outdoor stuff that's going on right now. It's just like it's, it's normalcy and it feels good. Um, I was out there today and it felt good to see, you know, just kids enjoying and smiling and laughing and interacting and, and doing it well. So, um, and hearing about the prom and such um, as well. It's just, you know, we're going the right direction. Within COVID, you know, as you probably saw last night, they did approve for 12 and up for Pfizer. I'm in communications with, I'm talking with Carolyn Ness, who's also talking with people, um, expanding that out. Um, trying to figure out if we can do a vaccination um, at the school. Um, they're doing something similar to that in Amherst. And I'm trying to, the problem is Pfizer is a little bit harder to get a hold of right now um, because of this. And so we're trying to work it out and see if it's possible. But those conversations are happening over the last few days. And so um, I'll let you know where we are with that. Um, but you know, the idea of trying to, making it easier um, for students. And we talked about this a lot in my administrative meetings um, we forget about access, you know, and someone would have to take a kid out of school, take them to somewhere to get a vaccination, just like adults, you know, students also don't have the access to the readily um, to be able to get to a vaccination and that kind of stuff. So we want to provide that, um, you know, not force it down people's throats, so to speak, or in their arms, um, but, you know, really just provide the avenue so it's easy to do if that's what they want to do. Amy, I guess. Yeah, just real quick. I think maybe you semi answered it in your last comment there. Um, I believe this year you guys were a little more strict on um, requiring a flu shot for kids. As this COVID shot rolls out for the kids, is there any guidance on if that's going to be a mandatory vaccine or not? It's not a mandatory. The governor has said that he's not going to make it mandatory. Um, we'll see what happens. There's some talk around the sides about all of a sudden making, you know, some official workers have to have to have it, but right now it's not a, it's not done that way. It's gonna be just like they tried to make the flu vaccine uh, mandatory and then they backed up when all the lawsuits lined up. Um, we'll see what happens here, but no, I mean, you, the only thing you can do right now is you could require any extracurriculars to get a vaccination or something like that. Um, again, you're going down a certain road. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge as we get there. We'll see what kind of um, resistance we have to that if we can get you know, the herd levels in our building. Keith, your hands up. Sorry, Bob, it's just using you. Yep, no, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask about um, if you foresee any changes in mask requirements for outdoor activities um, as we go through the spring, not necessarily for spectators, more for the athletes themselves. If I was reading something this morning from the CDC about outdoor transmission, whether we're going to stay with strict adherence or maybe athletes can 
Yeah, and you're right. I was at um, I was looking at the track meet, baseball game, softball game around me. It was awesome, and but I can't. I'm just wondering about the athletes having to wear masks once we get into. So, it's a good question. I asked Carl because I was watching I was watching baseball game. I was watching the varsity game playing Belchertown, and I'm watching a pitcher who I know is exactly 60 feet and 60 inches and six inches from the batter, because that's the distance from the. Why does he have to have his mask on? I mean, can he pull it down while he's pitching and not have to deal with one less obstacle? And apparent we got you know a parent um, inquiry complaint inquiry on that as well. Um, right now it's the MIA's guideline, and we're following on the MIA, but. I, you know, I asked him to bring it up at the athletic director's conference. Like, can we make reasonable modifications? If you're playing center field, do you have to have a mask on? You know, if you're at first base and you're holding a runner, maybe you have the mask on. You know, like, can we have, you know, you know, they have the mask on, but they have them on their face. So it's interpretation of that and in, in doing that. But, you know, we're questioning that as well. But right now we're following under the MIA guidelines for that. So, um, but I agree. There's some kind of silliness to some of the activities you're playing tennis in the singles. There's, you know what I mean? You're, there's no one on your, as our tennis team is doing, you know, you need to be wearing a mask. Right? And I would agree. But, um, you know, we're kind of in a cooperation in a cooperation with all the leagues. So we all have to do it together if we're going to change those rules. So we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll see that next month. George has got a hand. Going. I got a hand. So don't, I just want to, and I, I just want to uh, add something to this because I got, I got an email from the MIAA this afternoon and I'm just going to read it. Um, Keith, so there are some highlights from the most recent EEA guidelines as they relate to high school sports. And one of them, it says mandatory facial coverings for all sports during active play, except for low or moderate risk sports when outdoors where social distancing can be consistently maintained. So this update is going to be reviewed using the MIA governance process before implementation. So, um, so there may, they may be making exceptions for lower moderate risk sports uh, coming, coming down the line. The MIAA just has to review it. For, for mask wearing. So there you go. Thanks, George. Missy, you have a question? Uh, just, I guess my my only concern in those kind of scenarios is that you got somebody who's taking it off, you know, wiping and doing whatever. Now we're going to put it back on that, that we just have to be kind of mindful with our athletes and letting them know that this isn't like, let's touch all the outside of our mask and do all this other stuff and then go back and huddle in a group and... <laughs> and transmit those kind of things. So I, I don't think, I agree that there's plenty of distance for those kind of things, but I think we, we also need to include some education about how we're doing with the taking them on and taking them off. I just want to give you a little heads up when you know, talk about policies for shots. The, I have a son-in-law that's a Marine and they're in the, where he is, they're not, they don't have to have a shot. The military, is not required to have a shot yet. I, I can't believe it, but that's the military. So if that gives you any idea. <laughs> um, anybody else got a question? If not, we're going to go on to FRS retirees want to plant some trees. Darius? So we, re we, we received a request from the uh, – uh, Frontier Teachers Retirement, um, I guess, group association. Um, and they were asking if we could plant a tree um, to remote a memorial tree to honor those retired teachers who have passed away. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to share my screen just so I, you guys can read the names and such. Um, I guess I can put it in the public reading here so other people can as well. Um, So basically they ask if we would plant a tree memorial, memorial um, the following teachers who um, passed in 2020. And then they said there's also a list of, um, there's people who passed in 2019. Um, you know, and so looking to plant a tree. And so right now, I mean, we, I have a good spot for a tree. Um, and what, um, as in it, here it is. Oh, it's further down. Um, basically, right now, this tree here was taken out. Um, it fell over in a big storm, and it's like and it's a spot where a tree um, kind of grows very quickly and healthy because um, it gets a lot of sun. Um, and so we kind of we have a need for a tree. 
right there right now. Um, I am concerned um, about, I, I think my recommendation is that the, when we start having a plaque, so you have to update and kind of, you know, I mean, we're gonna, I was wondering if we just do a general tree in memory of all teachers who have passed who have served this district rather than choosing and missing some and creating a plaque that has to be updated every year, you know, um, you know, and that kind of thing on a school property. So that's not exactly what they wanted. And I'm sure if Bonnie's gonna be, Bonnie Harrison's the one who, who sent us this and is getting this going and she's gonna agree with me on this, but um, you know, I'd like to, I think we should probably look at in generalities to have a memorial tree for all those staff that work here. And then maybe at the school committee meeting, we could say, you know, we could do a public mentioning of who we're honoring this year um, with that tree. It's just it's one of those kind of those small things that people forget about. They get to continue to update something. You got to go out, send the plaque out, or get the things and paste them to the thing. And and then if you miss somebody, you know, it's extremely that can be extremely offensive as well. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So that's my editorial of that. Take it from there. Who's first, Keith? You want to go first? Oh. Could we put on the plaque? Uh, this would be first world problems, uh, 21st century solution, a website where you could update it so you don't have to take the plaque off so that it could always be accessible. And the second thing would be what kind of tree would it be to honor the teachers? Very symbolic, Keith. <laughs> I was trying to think of something funny and then it didn't really work. Uh, Missy, you have a question? Or just have your hand? No, up. I just forgot to lower it. That's all right. Does anybody else have a question about planting a nice tree? Who's going to plant it, Darius? Good question. Okay. I mean, we would have to contract with the with somebody to come out to dig the hole. And um, right now there's a stump there too. We probably can try to see if they'll help us remove that and put the other tree in. Um, and then they would purchase such a tree. I mean, right now the birches do very well in that area. Their, their lifespan is a little bit shorter than an oak. We're probably, and then if it's gonna be near the building, you gotta have something that's, you know, um, it's landscaping friendly to, toward a building and building friendly. So okay, that kind of thing probably, more likely a kind of a birch type of tree. It's pretty and so forth. Okay, do we have a, we're gonna vote on this uh, motion in a second. I'll make a motion. I'll second. A question. Who seconded? Uh, Damien. Damien. Damien, thanks. Should we, do, should we put in the minutes, Darius, about having it just a plaque for, deceased retirees without any names or do what key says have a on the website of list of retirees who passed away we could i think the website is a can i suggest a plan to be worked out between the superintendent and the retiree teacher association <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Deceased retirees got such a nice ring to it for a plaque. Uh, okay, Phil. Judy, you can write something up and, and you can put Darius as uh, the contact person. <laughs> Feels like a principal's job. It does feel like a principal's job. That's a good point, Darius. <laughs> <laughs> or George. <laughs> Okay, we got a motion in a second. Uh, Judy, you want to do a roll call, please? Sure, Bob? Yes. Lynn? Yep. Phil? Yes. Olivia? Yep. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Phil? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Next, uh, we're going to talk about some E&D funds. Yes, and thank you for that. That last, you know, my last comment there trying to be funny might have been, um, may have been a little harsh. So my apologies if I came out that way. When I tried to hand off a project when it's a really great project for us to do and stuff. So mm -hmm. I was trying to be funny and that may not been. Um, so I apologize. So E&D, um, right now I'm going sh to share my screen and Shelly's going to unmute and jump in when I misstep. She can do so well. Um, 
So as you know, uh, earlier this year, we talked about um, using $200,000 of E&D to offset the cost of the track. And the track numbers were projected to be coming in at possibly up to 800,000 and change. Um, the track came in at 638.7. Um, and so we now have a problem, which is kind of a good problem, is that we, we put money aside to use a V&D, and we need to spend that. If we're not going to spend on a track, we need to spend it on something else. And so I'm proposing you with you tonight how to use that E&D money um, moving forward. So we're basically what we're looking at here um is that as you do know we have been paying Berkshire Design the architect for the track is not part of that cost of six hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars six hundred thirty nine thousand dollars and we've been paying for that outside of that using school choice money so um so yeah I put this together although I'm speaking it should I do a lot of the brains behind the operation here um is to pull that off of school choice and pay for it with E&D bring up the school choice if there's an overage um small overage on the track we could just pay for it as school choice and those also um you know free up money in that account the second thing so i'll go through the whole list and then explain the whole thing and then you guys can ask questions because i can't see any of you when i'm presenting um the next thing is um the track does need new equipment um the pole vault and the high jump landing equipment is as old as the track um it's you know ripping in, in areas as you know, safety equipment has improved over years and i think it's the appropriate time when you update the track update the equipment and the landing areas are different configurations in the new track. So it also makes sense, makes sense to update that at this time as well. Um, the track Mountain View landscaping contract overage. So their bid came $8,700 and $8,750 over um, what we had projected for the bid. Um, on the, you know, so it's a small amount there. The next thing is a seven passenger van to replace, I mean, a nine passenger or I'm putting out there nine or 14 passenger van to replace the seven passenger van. So right now coming up in this one, kind of the, how older automobiles go, as I scroll down here, we can see it right, right? Let me get rid of this. All right. Um, we currently have two vans. We have the, the larger white um, van that says Frontier Regional. You've all seen it. it's like a mini bus. And we have what many of you may not know is we own a 2007 Chrysler Town and Country van. Look at that beauty. All right. This van is primarily used to transport um, special education students to job sites and other um, smaller field trips where there may be only um, two or three people going. We've also used it for extra cars for um, clubs and that kind of stuff when we needed a little bit more room. I would like to, to update this van to a larger model and do something. And this is again, only for getting the idea across, but this is a, you know, an example of a nine passenger van. Don't look at maker model um, or any of that sort, but the idea of doing something that's is gonna be able to be translated to for more activities for our school. Um, one of the reasons for a nine passenger van instead of the 14 one, it's a little bit more nimble um, and you know, the bigger van can be more difficult to drive. So. You know, putting that in the case and it's also you know probably a better gas pilot than another van but we're still kind of debating whether or not to do that or a 14 passenger so that's what we're discussing there and then the last part is right now we have a capital request and this is kind of the one where we, we're going changing our vote we have a capital request to the towns and, and as you know, you know we we the way we're approaching capital fixes in our buildings is we have a three-pronged approach we have the big six, which we're taking those are the big six project the track being the largest of them, um, where we have a we're getting a bond. We're using E and D. And then the last and then the final one is that we are you know going to the towns continually for um, you know direct capital warrant article requests. Um, given this year that we have this extra money, um, and some of the towns are are struggling. Um, you know, to meet the, the request that we're making this year for capital request, in order for us to look for another project when they have this issue, I think it would make sense for us to say, you know, let's withdraw the capital request to the towns and we'll pay for it ourselves this year because this is information we didn't have when we put that that, that request out to the towns. It made sense at the time to do the three, the three, um, 
the three pronged approach that we were doing at, at Bear Capital. But right now, to add on other projects, you know, when we put this out to the town and um, and such, in this particular year, I think we should pull that back. So a lot said there with a lot of different questions. I'm going to come back to the screen where I can see everyone. Um, you know, and yeah. Thoughts? Ask the questions. Judy? Can I just get that last dollar amount, Darius? I'm sorry, I'm putting it in the minutes. Was it $35,000? $35,000 is what we've requested for the, curtains. For the town. Thank you. Yep, yeah. okay. Not really a question, but. Yeah. Shelly, did I miss anything? You probably would have said it better. No, you got it. It was great. Right. Bill. Bill? I'm sorry. So, uh, that's all right. So, um, I just wanted to talk about the long suffering missing fourth prong in your analysis. Um, which is the, uh, the, 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 the long suffering frontier capital stabilization fund. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I just remember sitting in all those capital meetings and everything, and we all agreeing that we were going to start it up and fund it. And it, the funding part of it always just, we keep on not doing that. And, um, it makes a lot of sense to do that. So, you know, so so I I would propose, the, you know, the thirty five thousand dollar capital request is small enough that I don't I, I, I you know, at least in my town, that's nobody's nobody's going to uh, I can't I can't imagine, you know, substantial opposition to that. Um, and, and I think it's small enough in the other towns as well. And I would like to see us start to start doing things for, for the capital stabilization fund in our own school. Um, and because, uh, you know, just it, it's worked out so well in Conway having one for the elementary school so, um, and, and one that is used in, as part of the budget process every year and funded and all that. So this seems like an opportunity to stick, you know, and I would say rather than withdrawing the the um, the, the, the the capital warrant to, to take that thirty five thousand and tr start breathing life into our own capital stabilization fund. Just, just saying. Bill, I see your hands up, sir. Yeah, um, I have to take the opposite approach that Phil just took, and I, I'll come down on the side of, with Darius on this one. I think um, with all that's happened in the towns, the towns were extremely forthcoming with with their portion of the money to help us pay with pay for COVID-related costs and all kinds of things going on in the town. I, I, I think that the optics and the gesture here of us withdrawing that capital article and paying for it ourselves with money that has come along, I think it is worth far more to us than the $35,000 is. I think it's, I think it's just the right thing to do is to, to take that, that capital article off the warrant and pay for it ourselves since we have the ability to pay for it ourselves instead of spending money on something else and, and asking towns for money at the same time, just, Pay for it ourselves. I, I could tell you, Phil, that maybe Conway's not their portion of the thirty-five thousand is not a problem, and I could probably speak for Waitley; it's probably not a problem. But other towns may have a problem with it. And yeah, it's it's only X amount of dollars, but in some of these situations, um, I think that I mean, I think Darius has a good plan about taking it off. Will look good on. A town meeting floor by withdrawing them. I mean, I think that that's worth that's worth a lot too. So, um, does anybody else have any questions? Okay. I, uh, I Darius and I obviously have not talked about this um, piece. We did talk about the importance of capital stabilization, especially when we're talking about you know, roof replacement. And I know that that's part of the big six, but that project could end up being larger than what the original financing was. And, you know, I, I do think we recognize the importance of planning for those larger things for the future, not just picking off at the smaller things. Um, you know, and, and we certainly, Darius and I did not talk about a number here, but I'd also don't see a reason why you couldn't 
change the E and D number. This is a recommendation that we're having right now. And if the committee felt strong enough that this is something that we need to do, um, we add X amount to this number and we increase it. I don't think it's going to be an issue for us to do that. Um, <clears throat> we do have some surplus funds because of various things, transportation, personnel changes, um, our school choice number, our revenue looks to be higher, our regional transportation reimbursement looks to be higher. So, you know, I definitely think that's something we could broach right now uh, if the committee wanted to explore that further. I also don't know, Darius, can we, we could do a second vote for E&D in June, right? And go and ask the towns. I don't know if that makes sense to split it up, but. <clears throat> Correct, we could table any portion of this except the, um, I'm going to turn and look at the my back down down the wall, except for the town meeting stuff that goes to town meeting. So, I mean, any, all this other stuff could be tabled to June um, to discuss further. But I hear what you're saying, Shelley, is that you know we could, if we want to start to um, put money into the stabilization account. My concern on that is that in order for that to be an effective amount of money, that's a lot you're gonna to have to put in there when we are trying to right now, and I know what you're saying, Phil, we could we could save that 35,000 or whatever number we make up um, or wanna add into it, but you know, we're kind of like right now, as we have the money, we're spending the money on projects. There are other projects on the list, but I just kind of felt like if for us to suddenly add more projects on our E&D list this late in the game, you know, you're about to also approve the fact that we got the gym floor. Were you spending last year's money as well? In going with, you know, Bill just said the optics are like, wow, we got a lot of money suddenly. They don't realize that we saved and didn't do anything last year. Um, and, and they didn't go after the town the same year. I, I just, you know, and I know <laughs> what was said is that Sunderland and Deerfield are in a tighter spot um, and probably could use a little relief when you're talking about $20,000. What's well, $20,000 with the capital projects they could do somewhere else? Um, and for, um, you know, for uh, Sunderland's what six or seven thousand um, dollars is what we're talking about there portion. So um, anyway, so that's my kind of my thoughts on that. You know, we start, you know, right now we're using E and D in that way. We it is basically a, you know, we're using it as a a, a fund to rotate um, to deal with capital expenditures. Very transparent. They actually have a say in it. Remember when we approve this. We do have to send a letter to the select boards for them to take action within 30 days. Okay, so um, you know if they disagree with it, you know that kind of thing is um, they'd have to have a meeting. It's very hard to disagree with it, but there's a lot of transparency there. We're not just putting money away then spending it on our own. We're kind of working with the towns because Shelley is right. We started talking about the roof project. The money we have in this, in this grant, the guy who was up there said, "You got a 25 year old flat roof." you're gonna start having major problems and the money you put aside for this isn't gonna be enough to do the whole thing. So that's a problem down the road. You know, I also got a tennis court that's almost unplayable. That's, you know, it just got worse and worse over the last two years. That's another quarter of a million dollar project down the road. So there's gonna be a lot of other stuff that $35,000 in the account or $50,000 in the account is not gonna be as important as trying to keep a great working relationship with the towns um, and transparency. <laughs> Keith? Just in terms of funding mechanisms and, and to what Phil was saying, would it be Frontier that would have to create the, the stabilization fund or would it be more on the, the individual towns, pre-existing stabilization funds going to both the, their local elementary school and Frontier rather than Frontier trying to build that? I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering where that, that would be allocated out. I think that's a good question, Keith. Um, my understanding of it is that Frontier would establish the fund. The towns, I think, also have to approve that we're establishing this fund because they do pay into our assessments. Um, <clears throat> but then it would be our responsibility how we fund it, whether it's funded E&D, budget, another pot of money. Um, and if it is E&D, then we then ask the towns again, as Darius just said, um, to approve or question or, or deny. Um, I don't think we have a capitalization 
fund set up. We have a regional transportation stabilization fund, but I don't think we have a capital stabilization fund. So I'd have to look into a little bit more also for the legality of it. If, if you could, though, Shelly, because I, I think when we when we looked at this a few years ago, we did have one. It was already old then and it had eleven thousand dollars in it. And um, and that was that was years ago. And that's just my recollection of it. Um, and, you know, it, the 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 it, I, I, and I'll just speak for Conway. The, the only way that the that Conway could have access to the town's capital stabilization was to have its own. Um, or, or at least that was certainly the preference of the town bookkeepers and whatnot. So that's what we did. And, um, and, and the advantage of that at town meeting is that, you know, you get to say rather than, a, than, than an expense coming out of your assessment, um, it, it comes out of capital stabilization. Um, and uh, so that's, it tends to be, the withdrawals from it tend to be easier to pass. You still have to vote money then to, 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 to go into it, but, um, but like, um, it's, it's, so, but it, 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 it tends to be easier to vote money to go into it because at that point, you're not talking about a specific item. You're usually talking about the, just the generic need to take care of the schools, which is always a good thing. So, Right. And, it, and it's, remember, I'm thinking back to Decker, uh, Bob Decker, who kind of explained to us, as a, I'm trying to remember, you guys remember that conversation where there's a certain kind of voting in order to actually access those funds out of that as well. So we'll have to kind of get refreshed in the law there. The issue, if we're going to do that, though, it's again, you start to go into what is your funding mechanism for capital projects. So if we're going to do, if we're going to start putting money into a fund, and that's how we're going to fund our projects. You mean we're going to start having all these piles of monies in different places with not enough to do in any one pile. But so if you want to go that route, then you got to kind of establish and you got to kind of make sure the towns are on board with it, that we're going to put $100,000 a year and dedicate $100,000 a year or more into capital stabilization. And we're going to fund that every single year. You know what I mean? And build that up. And, you know, that's you're, you're talking about bigger numbers than than that. And we could do that right now. We're using the we're doing the same kind of idea with E and D, um, but you could be saving up for a much bigger project, I guess, in those kind of terms. So, And, and, I, and I would have suggested the, in the 30 to 50 range, because I think that's more doable, it just takes longer. But, but I mean, generally that is best practices and that is how most do it, is a separate capital budget and a separate operating budget. And that's how it works through, through a cap, through a vigorous capital, stabilization fund um so that's okay so that can we do this to kind of if you don't mind me trying to direction it so have shelly and i look into for the june meeting the capital stabilization fund and after looking into it we can come back with a recommendation about taking some money out of end and putting into the capital stabilization fund and then and start talking about long-term effects there um outside of that looking back at the e and d list can it does the committee feel okay with voting you know voting that for you know we the only one that's time sensitive is they're time sensitive um town meetings well they're all time sensitive because we do have to encumber funds by june 30th but the thirty-five thousand is what's most pressing because conway is first on june 5th and we wouldn't meet again until after conway's meeting um so we at least need to resolve that piece and that is for the duct cleaning in the gym and the auditorium and the stage curtains that we already asked the town to cover on warrants <clears throat> I think I would I would say that I, I I support Phil in his request for a continued review you know a, a review of or a plan to um, create capital stabilization we have definitely bounced it around along a bunch of times we've talked about it in various subcommittees and we've talked about it in group committee and it's a solid plan that leaves some really positive results um, same thing happened in Sunderland but I'm inclined for us to move forward with the proposal as presented 
pull the two town warrant, pull the town warrants for the cleaning, the address the other, the total vote itself, and move on to the next thing, which we have to yep. talk about. Are you looking for a second, Judy? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm looking for a second. Thank you, Bob. I'll be a second for you. Thanks. Darius, you want to take this other thing off the... Let me stop, is what you're saying? Yeah, please. <laughs> please. Put it back up because people were talking about it and I think it makes it close well. Okay, so you ready for a roll call vote? Everybody understands what we're voting on? Any other questions, Keith? I, I just want to clarify. So we're, we're approving all the lists that Darius took down and we're going to discuss opening up a, a, a stabilization fund within Frontier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dog approved. <laughs> okay, roll call vote. Bob? Yes. Lynn? Yeah. Phil? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yes. Okay. Next is uh, the awarding of the Jim Floor contract. Shall you want to take this one? Or I'll yep. do it. No, it's fine. Um, so we put the Jim Floor project that was approved with last year's e and That went out to bid in, I want to say, early February. Um, Bill did a walkthrough with any interested parties. It wasn't a requirement to visit the school. It was just an open meeting. Um, so he did have some folks come over April break and take a look. Uh, we received four bids, um, and we do need to award, I think, by the end of this week. So we are looking for a vote on that contract tonight. Um, we had allocated $35,000 of E&D for the project. The company um, that is the lowest winning bidder is Gymnasium Floors Incorporated out of Stoughton, Mass. Um, their bid was $27,843. Uh, there's some additional expenses outside of just finishing the floor, um, which my understanding is, you know, it's stripping um, putting the new logos down and then sealing. Um, so there's other things that go along with that, some electrical and those kind of pieces. So the total project right now is still coming in under the 35,000. Um, those smaller pieces, Bill and I will handle, handle directly. We're going to be probably right around 32,000 for a whole. Um, but we do need to have you all formally accept the bid and award the contract. Um, I know Darius did check uh, at least one of their references, and we did send out, I believe, um, their bid information to you all. So I can take questions if you have them. Move to approve the bid. bid amount. Do you put it under thirty-two, just at thirty-two thousand dollars, Shelley, or do you want to actually put the bid amount plus incidentals? I think you just have to bid the contract because you've already approved the thirty-five thousand through E and D. So I think we can manage the rest of that. So mm -hmm. the twenty-seven thousand eight hundred forty-three because we're going to handle those other pieces on our own. <clears throat> Do I have a second? Who's the first? Me. Bill. Me. Oh, thank you. I'll second it. Roll call, please. Up. Yes. Lynn? Yes. Phil? Yes. Olivia? Yes. <coughs> Judy? Yes. Mary? Yes. Uh, Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Phil? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next is uh, School Committee Anti Racism Professional Development. And who's going to take this? Um, <laughs> go ahead, Olivia. You want to introduce? Um, so, um, uh, earlier on, I think a few meetings ago, um, when Jen uh, Smith shared her um, the list of all the different things they had been doing over at the um, elementary school, um, you know, a lot of people were looking into doing some different things, um, and I think that I had 
I had brought, I had spoken to Darius and said that, you know, I know that we're all really um, committed to having a school that um, is as welcoming and inclusive to everyone as possible. And so um, wanted us to think about a way that we could either take one of her suggestions and yeah, make a commitment to um, either, you know, read a something or do a something or watch a something. I'm sure, you know, I mean, if you're a teacher right now, I know Keith, like you've been to, done a million of <laughs> these, you know, different things right now. Um, and maybe at some point, you know, we could make a plan to come together, not on screen, because I don't feel like that would be <laughs> productive at all, but just make a commitment to um, choose a way to broaden our own horizons um, and then share that with the group, um, perhaps, you know, maybe over the summer, you know, and then at our, you know, before our first meeting or around then come together and, and talk about that. I just think that is a guiding force, you know, um, for different situations in our community that um, it shows that we're doing the work as well. Um, so I didn't know what you guys thought about that and if we could... Um, you know, make a commitment or, a, you know, plan to make a commitment about that. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Olivia. Um, else? Who said something? Who else? Anybody else want to say something? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I do too. Keith? I think the idea of doing something, I, uh, Doing another online training where we on Zoom would be problematic, but maybe if um, over the summer everyone committing to reading one of the the readings that the students are doing, so we we know what what they're involved in, we can see it firsthand. Might be a good way to start. Um, I agree. And I think steps. Since what we would be doing wouldn't be something that needed public comment. The reason we're meeting right now online is so that as many people as possible, we don't have to limit it. Um, but where we would, you know, maybe get together and just share what we had done, that could be done in, you know, a big circle all together in person where we just share our, our thoughts, you know, whether it's inside the school or outside the school um, that we wouldn't have to do. I'm with you on the no more online trainings. <laughs> Olivia, can I ask, do you think it would be facilitated in the same manner that other professional development is, either Kelsey or Amanda or whoever, you know, like some other, is this a self-guided um, reflection pro or well, I mean, that, process, that or are we just kind of winging it making it up? <laughs> Which I'm fine with. That's, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think that's what I was wanting to um, put up for um, a thought. You know, I thought that what Jen shared had some really good starting points, but I also really like, you know, especially where we're the Frontier School Committee, and we know that the school summer lists and different things that the kids will be reading and bringing into their um, purview for um, what they'll need to know for the fall that maybe, you know, taking on one of those, you know, books about that would would be helpful as well. Um, and I didn't necessarily have a, a structure that I just thought that it would, I, I was interested in, in doing this and doing something where we all got each other's opinions about this and could talk about it in a way that wasn't broadcast <laughs> um, to everybody um, and where we could share our feelings about, you know, the different things that you know, the kids are reading or that the teachers are learning and, and where we come from in that and just acknowledging our own places in that. Um, and so I know everybody's busy, but I, I was hoping that if we could commit to make a plan to either do, you know, one of the readings that Jen said or, you know, what the school is doing and then just to get together, you know, and, and be able to unpack those. Keith? I would suggest that uh, we could do one reading over the summer and then meet for 30 minutes to one hour before one of our regularly scheduled meetings in the fall where we could discuss amongst ourselves. Um, and, and I don't know how, if it needs to be facilitated or if, every, if you know, just as a, I think Olivia's just saying, everyone come in, just give your thoughts about what you've read. Everyone can speak and talk amongst yourselves. And then, because there's no official policy making, there's no decision making. And then we can go into our regularly scheduled scheduled meeting, so it's not so um, 
uh, time consuming or difficult for people. I think that's a great idea. Good um, suggestion. Um, so um, I'm up for doing the, the thing with the Frontier, you know, taking one of their readings since we're on Frontier School Committee. I think that's a really great idea, Keith, if everyone else is up for doing that over the summer, taking on one of those, um, well, you know, multicultural readings or something um, that um, the school has um, assigned and that sort of thing to the students. Um, and then maybe before our September meeting, meet for about an hour. Darius, can you help us get those books? Okay. Darius said yes. <laughs> we'll sign you up, Lynn. So I'm guessing those will come out pretty soon. You know, the, the read the summer reading list thing. So um, then we'll be able to pick those. Perfect. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, we're going to review uh, director administration's contract. Um, the subcommittee uh, met. It was a it was a great meeting, and we were very successful. We thought. Um, I was on the committee from Frontier, and Judy was also. And then we had um, one each from the other the other towns. Um, Jessica from Sunderland. Um, Phil, were you from Conway? Were you on it? I am from Conway. Well, I know you're from Conway. Um, who's, yes. Who's, who's, yes. Who's, who's, yes. I was, I was, I was, uh, I was, a, I was a member of that. Uh, and who was from Deerfield? Gary. Forever, right? Gary who? Gary. Oh. Yeah. And Gary. then, um, we had, uh, Bethany from Waitley. Yeah. And, but it, I thought it went well. Um, um, do we have, I, I sent the message, to Darius, do we have to go into executive session, Darius, to talk about eighth in particular, or do we just tell them what we came up with for monies or do we have to go into executive session for that? No, it has to be open session. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to go into executive to do that, but if you were to, if you want to discuss the negotiation of it, you would go into executive session. But you have to come back to vote the, the final contract. I so. personally don't think we have to go into executive session to talk about it. I mean, we came we came up with a set of numbers. Shelly came up with a set of numbers, and correct me if I'm wrong, Shelly. That I think we were on the final year, uh, we were fifty dollars off, <clears throat> and. Yeah. Um, and basically what we're going to do is um, end the contract that she has now. Correct me if I'm wrong again. Correct, end the contract that she is now. And we came up with a five-year contract for Shelly. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Shelly I, probably. I, I'll do them because it's uncomfortable for Shelly to do that. It would, that's not fair to do that to her. Well. I know. I feel like I should excuse myself from the meeting at this point. All right. So you can send your screen off, Shelly, if you want. No. Um, we don't want you to. No. So, we so, what the, so what we did. Go ahead. So, so what we did is we looked at comparable um, size districts and um, average salaries of, of uh, business directors and business service um, people in Western Massachusetts to, to like size districts. And um, Shelly was very much on the lower end of that, um, lower mid end of that, not the lowest end, but definitely on the lower end, and especially five um, five districts as well. You know, you have some people are making um, are only in charge of one budget instead of five. So that was all discussed, and so basically the the committee agreed to um, move Shelly, who's supposed to make a hundred and nine next year. To make a hundred, move a ten thousand to one hundred and nineteen um, for next year, and then do a five-year contract at two and a half percent for the rest of the remainder of those years. Does that make sense? So, um, <coughs> so yeah, so make one hundred nineteen thousand the first year, one hundred twenty-one the following year, and two two and a half percent moving forward there. Um, and that was decided. That the one debate that happened in the meeting was whether or not to spread it out. 
the growth over the five years or to make the correction to put her, and this will put her um, in the mid upper mid range, not the highest, but the upper mid range to her peers in the Valley. So um, any questions on that there? And just would like to say that this was that that, that the premise behind doing this was the uh, unanimous belief that uh, that that Shelley is excellent at her current position and that we want to keep her there. So that was that was really the theme of the whole thing. And it's a and it, it didn't say it's a five year contract. So yes. Um, uh, Keith, you have a question? I don't echo what Phil said about. Uh, I, I think Shelly's doing a great job. I'm, I'm very, very happy. But just for open, uh, total transparency, what would be the districts that we were comparing to? Um, we looked at Mahar, Greenfield, Hampshire Regional, um, Mohawk, um, Pioneer, um, and looking and in each each one of those as well. There is some factors. There's some where Person only works four days a week. There's some where the person doesn't um, lives remotely. You know, so some things were adjusted on those. Um, but those are the those are the schools we looked at overall. We had the list of almost everybody in, but those are the more comparative schools. Um, and looking at you know Amherst, um, Northampton, those were also looked at as well. Um, we didn't look at like Springfield or anything like that. That doesn't fit. That. Right. It sounds schools. like you're working geographically to a comparable districts right around us. And all right, thank you. But the, yeah. the one comparable though that, that sticks with me that I just like to share with you, Keith, is that um, with with this new current adjustment at this new five year thing, she she's now roughly at about what Gateway pays theirs. So and, and Gateway is a smaller district and uh, like a lot smaller. So you know that's that's a good co comparison and shows shows what ballpark we're still in. So. And I think we said this at the Deerfield meeting, but it, it's one of those things. It's a it's a financial issue that administrators have in schools because you get you get locked in, and, and if you can't renegotiate, sometimes um, in compa while comparing the rest of the market, the only way you can get an increase is to leave. Um, so if Shelly was to leave us this this year or next year, you know, you're, you're going to be starting the market about just about where she's at here, or maybe you can get a slightly lower, but. Um, you know, that's just the way the market, the market works and how people get locked in. And the only way you can do things is to move. So, or to do things like this. And so when people are saying, what are you doing here? Shelly was hired at a lower mark. She had no prior experience. And, you know, we took advantage of that um, in the sense of you don't have experience, you're going to get a lower amount. She's proven that she's proven her worth, as you've stated. Um, I'll say it too. Um, and, you know, deserves to that to have that readjust, that adjusted thing. Anybody else? Mary? Yeah, I would I would just like to say, um, you know, I like I like doing it that way where we increase it on the front end. I think it makes more sense and is um, easy to explain. Um, but also, you know, while it's uncomfortable for Shelly to have to sit here, I also want her to hear the good things. Um, and from my standpoint, it's not just numbers and budgets we've had people in the past that can do the numbers and the budgets but you know i just feel you're so professional in your role in your presentations in your interactions with um, the select boards and finance committees we've heard just wonderful things and leadership qualities within your own office even in the personnel that you have to work with is all done very professionally so um, i'm a huge fan and definitely in favor of the five-year contract. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank all of you. <laughs> Very awkward and uncomfortable situation. <laughs> okay, who wants to make the motion? I will. I will. Is that Phil? Yep. Well, second. Okay. Oh. <laughs> all right. I can't see the screen and do the and type at the same time. So, okay. Roll call. You ready? The kids ready? Yep. Okay. Bob. Yes. Lynn. Yes. Bill. 
Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Phil? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Congrats. Welcome to the crew for another five years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, reports. Um, I have nothing. Lynn, do you have anything from the collaborative? Not a whole lot. They're just doing some internal speculation and still trying to get a, um, an executive director on board. They're going to have, they have two finalists now. We're going to be talking to them next week. Thank you. Uh, George? Hi, so um, I shared uh, my report with everybody, uh, but just to highlight a few things. Um, so once again, to reiterate, we did have our prom uh, last Friday. Um, we had it at the building. We had it in the courtyard. Um, it was uh, it was uh, it was a resounding success. It was wonderful. It was great to have to see all the kids having such a great time. Um, the parents that helped out to, with their decor with uh, with decorating and with and with organizing. Um, we're, we're incredibly lucky to have so many people that, that pitched in to just to make it such a giant success. Um, our, our teachers that helped out, our senior class advisor, Melissa Strelke, I mean, it was, honestly, it was just, it was wonderful. Um, and we're going to be uh, continuing with a lot of different events for the seniors throughout this month. Uh, graduation is still, still slated to happen on the 4th of June. Um, they're gonna. There's going to be another. Uh, there's going to be another parade with uh, with cars that 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 same week. That Thursday, there's going to be an awards, a virtual awards ceremony that that week on the Wednesday. Uh, there's going to be a senior clap out day where they're going to be going to the elementary schools um, to to visit their elementary school teachers, and we're going to do it outside. Um, there's going to be a senior breakfast. So there are a number of things happening and a number of events happening for our seniors. Um, uh, we're also in the process of doing, we're, we're hiring, we just hired successfully, we just hired a middle school math teacher and a high school math teacher. We're in the process of interviewing for special ed, uh, special ed positions, uh, and we're also in the process of um, interviewing and doing demo lessons for world languages position, or for one world language position, I should say. Uh, and we're in the middle of MCAS. MCAS is happening as we speak. It's going to be, uh, we've got uh, 10th grade math happening for the next two days. Uh, middle school is happening in, in, in a week or so. So um, there's a lot going on this month. Uh, I've, in the report, I also shared a, um, a link to the senior calendar um, for for um, so you have so you have a, a sense as to when things are happening as well. Um, but things are going things are are things are going well. It's busy and and it's 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 getting to be an exciting time of year. So it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun as well. So yeah, thanks, George. Darius, do you have anything to share with us? Only what I said at the uh, Deerfield meeting. Uh, my my last new superintendent induction program is Thursday, so after that, I'm ready to run the district. <laughs> hey, you'll be a senior. They'd be calling you. That's that's pretty funny. Yeah, it's been three years for those wow. it, monthly meetings on that. So just FYI, it was a lot of work. So just just mentioning it. All right. I have nothing else. Uh, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Everybody raised their hand. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.